Well, if you'll be taking your seats, we'll be beginning here in just a moment. I notice they have the clock position just beneath the uh, blinding airport lights. So the speaker cannot see what time it is, so y'all may need to help him to tell him when to quit. I don't know. Russ will be fine with that. I hope you've been enjoying the lecture so far. I think we got off to a great start last night, and uh, it's been a fine uh, morning together. And so we've come to uh, this hour in which our speaker is Russ Roberts, and uh, he and his wife Elizabeth uh, have lived in Florida since uh, 2017. And there he serves as a full-time evangelist at the South Jacksonville Church. Uh, they had a couple of uh, children that attended Florida College. Uh, he uh, got an engineering degree from Texas A&M and worked for uh, the federal government for 31 years. We won't hold that against him. Uh, but uh, after retiring, uh, he's labored with, uh, you know, uh, in many different places for the gospel, uh, overseas as well and even served for a period of time when he was in the D.C. area as an elder at the Nannadale uh, congregation. So we're looking forward to uh, what Russ has to share with us about the concept of our redemption from slavery and, of course, what that means for us as God's people and the redemption that we have in Christ. We certainly uh, commend his lesson to you and uh, ask that you give him your undivided attention this morning. Not everyone feels the necessity to be redeemed. Actually, most people, if you were to talk to them about it, they think it was strange, almost insulting, if you were to suggest that they needed to be rescued from something, to be vindicated and delivered back. And then with the urgency in which we tell them, that's the way we preach the gospel, with urgency, that they don't understand what you're saying. We use the term redeemed in our modern vernacular as being rescued, compensated for a past performance, or vindicated. I want to thank, thank Florida College for this opportunity to speak, especially with those that are among the speakers uh, on, on the lecture this, this time. But I also want to thank Drs. McClister and Hamilton for allowing me to speak as well. Even though David knew me, he asked me to come. I stood right here about 40 years ago, and I am positive that I said something rather goofy several times. So maybe the topic of redemption may not have been a coincidence completely. <laughs> we will see. But again, not everyone feels the necessity to be redeemed. A couple of years ago, when my wife and I were working in our backyard, flower gardens, we heard this strange animal sound. So as we went closer to this animal, we saw that it was these two beautiful black-bellied whistling ducks. And they were wheezing, evidently whistling, because five of their ducklings had fallen down in a drain in our backyard. So I called my friend Mike Smiley, who is here, and my wife, we dug them out one at a time and watched them swim back to their parents that were waiting in the pond behind us. So they were rescued from certain death. They were given back to their rightful owners. So the word today, redeemed, ranges from being able to compensate from a past performance being able to be rescued from a drain, to be able to claim a, a prize from a winning ticket. Another occurrence that we're familiar today is when you buy something online prior to the completion of that transaction, we're often prop, uh, prompted to get, uh, have an option to, have a, uh, to redeem a gift card so that we bring the cost down. When I was in London, we lived in London, my wife and I, along with several of the other members of, of the congregation there, we went to the theater. <laughs> That's what they call it there, I think. 
And boy, was I a fish out of water from growing up in Oklahoma and Texas. I mean, give me a tractor pull or a, a rodeo any day. But we went, and when we went, we went to the concierge, and we'd give them our coat or our hat, and they'd give us a ticket. And on the way out, we were able to redeem the things that we had. That's the concept of redemption. And I know most of you in the audience today have talked to people that you feel need to be redeemed. Like the ducklings who had fallen down this drain, because of what the scriptures say, you feel that they are eternally lost without some type of redemption from Jesus Christ. And the most difficult task that I have, at least, talking to the lost, is convincing them of this point being able to tell them that they're lost in their sin and have a non-relation with God. And they cannot even imagine anything that they have done to initiate this discussion and that you feel like they need to be redeemed. True redemption is available to those who feel that they cannot be escaped on their own. The agony of being trapped with no escape by one's own means, it must be realized. And again, in our Western world, with all the freedoms and personal rights that we have that are protected by strong and fortified governments, most people do not feel any reliance on anything or anybody but their own wits, their knowledge, and their ability. Why should they be redeemed? This morning, we have a story about a people who had to learn the concept of being redeemed. God will not rescue them until they realize the need and ask for it. And we begin <clears throat> with the story, of course, in the book of Genesis, where God had committed to a series of promises through the patriarchal, age, through the patriarchal uh, lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says in Genesis, the 12th chapter, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and I'll make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse you, those who are cursing you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. What I'd like to do is talk about two of these promises today. The first promise that we'll talk about, the land promise. And that's what brought them out of the land of Egypt. And then I want to close with a spiritual lesson that we have on the seed promise. And so Jacob, son Joseph, he is sold to a band of Ishmaelites passing by. And it was a series of, of unlikely events that 70 of the descendants went down into Egypt to an area to where this idea and this concept of redemption is cultivated. And when the book of Genesis closes, the Israelites lived in an almost utopian set. They lived within a mighty nation of Egypt, and it was a powerful nation, if not the most powerful of the land. They were highly intelligent. They were architecturally geniuses, but they were extremely, extremely paganistic. And because of Jehovah's hand, that he and uh, because of Jehovah's hand throughout and and his faithful servant Joseph, Egypt remained economically stable and in a position to demand whatever they wanted, no matter how severe the famine. At the death of Jacob, Joseph's humble brothers were concerned that they would uh, <coughs> they'd take revenge because of what they sell him. And you remember what Joseph said. He says in Genesis, the fifth chapter, do not be afraid, for I am I in the place of God but as you meant it evil for me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it all about as it is this day to save many people of life. The statement is interesting. He felt that his travel to Egypt was, was providential, but I cannot imagine that he felt just how providential it was. Saving many people alive. Certainly it meant saving the starvation from those in the, uh, from the famine. But did he really understand that what he was doing was setting up and being part of God's providence that he would lead them to a land of their forefathers? 
And then when Moses introduces us to the book of Exodus, the scene is quite different. The initial verses tell us how God had multiplied the Israelites into a great population, but it quickly turns sour. Depending on how you count the years, 400 years had passed since Joseph's influence in, in, in Egypt, and Joseph couldn't live forever, and the Pharaoh who surged him to power couldn't live, stay on the throne. Not only were the Israelites stripped of their royalty, but at this point they were full-fledged slaves. The utopian setting is over, and it had been for several years. The scriptures are silent between Genesis and Exodus, and some commentators felt that this silence is grand. It's almost hallowed and being unnecessary to charter from the concept of royalty to servitude. Alfred Edersheim reflects, the silence of three and a half centuries is almost awful in its grandeur, like the loneliness of Sinai, the mount of God. In just eight verses, Israel transitioned from royalty to slave without a hint of wrongdoing. It was, as the scripture says, only because they were so populated, only because as they were afflicted, God strengthened them and made them more populous. And I believe the scriptures te plainly teach that Joseph's flight to Egypt when he was sold by his jealous brothers was just part of the redemptive plan. The Israelites were planted deep within the Nile's fertile delta in the most powerful nation of the world. This protection of the, the powerful nation plus the fertile soil helped them grow and flourish to almost two men, or over two million people. They needed to be redeemed, but their hearts were far from seeing its necessity. God's plan was to bring a people out with a renewed mind, a changed heart, an organized structure, and an inspired law. You may remember when Abraham received these promises scattered out through Gen Genesis, the 12th chapter through Genesis 22, one of the times that he was talking to Abraham, he said, he told him about the land promise, and, and Abraham said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? And he says that you will serve, you'll, go, you'll be strangers in this foreign land, and you will serve them, and they will afflict you 400 years. And also, this nation whom, whom they serve, I will judge, and afterwards I will bring them out in great possessions. That was Abraham. And then Jacob, as he's going down to Egypt, questioning why he should go, here God comes to him, and he says, don't fear. Go to Egypt, and I will make you a great nation there. And I will go down with you to Egypt, and I'll also bring you out. You may remember the story of Joseph when he first met his brothers, and he, he revealed himself to his brothers. He actually told them in Genesis 45, he tells them, don't worry. I know, don't grieve because of what you've done. He said, because God sent me here to preserve life. Here it is death. Joseph is telling his family. He said, I, know, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land of Egypt, which he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So what I'd like to do is just present two reasons, uh, two ways in which God has, uh, has teach his, his children these two concepts of redemption. Before they would, he would pull them out and redeem them, they had to recognize the concepts of redemption. They were chosen people of God, but before that, they had to be redeemed or rescued from Egyptian captivity before they could be rescued, they first had to learn the concepts of redemption. And so I believe it's these two concepts. The first concept is they need to understand a need for a redeemer. Just like our friend who you approach about being saved didn't comprehend it, God's new people will also have to learn the concept and learn to appreciate it. God uses personal events in man's life to teach on concepts in these heavenly concepts like mercy and grace and atonement for sin. And it's so that his 
creation will, will fully appreciate the blessings. You may recall when the, uh, in the period of the divided kingdoms, the northern kingdom of, of Israel had betrayed God through their constant disobedience. What God did is he embedded Israel's repetitive defiance into the life of his prophet Hosea by instructing him to take a wife of, high, of harlotry. His passionate preaching to this arrogant and ignorant nation demonstrated how he appreciated God's feeling towards Israel and his lack of betrayal. Hosea learned the truth about God's love, mercy, and obedience through his marriage with Gomer, his unfaithful wife. In Egypt, the Israelites will learn the necessity of being redeemed. Another concept of this idea of redemption is that we should recognize <coughs> that it should be more personal. A great example of this is the story of Jessica McClure. Many of you may know and remember in 1987 at the age of 18 months, this baby who's referred to as, as baby Jessica fell 22 feet down an 8-inch water uh, well casing in her aunt's backyard in Midland, Texas. The whole nation watched for the next 56 hours as the rescuers pulled this innocent baby's safety from her apparent doom. And during this entire process, the parents a baby Jessica pleaded for prayers <clears throat> prayers and help as they listened to their toddler song echoing up the shaft of the well. So when Jessica was res rescued, everyone rejoiced, especially those in Midland. But as nerve-wracking as that was to everybody that watched, although we felt a great pain for the parents, our compassion and our sympathy, it was limited. And it was because we were not personally involved. If, however, it was one of our children that were down that well, or if we ourselves were the subject of one of these disasters, our yearning for redemption would be that much greater. It would be real. See, when all that process was going on, and we were living in Belton, Texas at the time, when all that was going on, even when we got some bad news, my wife and I were able to go to sleep. <laughs> it may have bothered us some, but we were able to go to sleep. It wasn't personal to us. But can you imagine what was going through the minds of the parents of baby Jessica? Knowing that their child was just a few yards away, <laughs> down 22 feet in a well that was helpless, and hungry. We must feel the, the need to be rescued before we appreciate the redemption process. The more personally one is involved, the more the helpless situation is sensed, and the more the act of Redeemer is understood and appreciated. The descendants of Abraham must first feel the need to be rescued, a reason to be rescued, before God will send a redeemer. And by his people to actually live in the definition, they would learn this meaning of redemption. The second point that I believe that God teaches them through the scriptures is that it must, it must be a true redeemer. They need to know that someone could actually help. Not everyone who wants to help can be a true redeemer. Can you imagine if the cousins of the McClure's showed up, John Ed and Joe Bill, those are good western Texas names, <laughs> they showed up with their deer knife and maybe their folding latrine uh, shovel, <laughs> say, we want to help. The McClure's would say, I need a true redeemer. I need someone that can actually help. Many Bible commentators equate Moses' outreach to his people in killing the Egyptian as his first attempt to save Israel. And actually, when Stephen was standing up in front of the Sanhedrin in Acts, the seventh chapter, he recounts this incident when Moses killed this Egyptian 
And he records that Moses supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand. But they didn't understand. Possibly, it was that Moses had all intentions of rescuing them and going to, his, their, uh, to this promised land. If that was his intention, he failed miserably. And it was because neither he was recognized by God or he was recognized by the people as a redeemer at that time. But 40 years later, Moses did return, returned to be the redeemer of his people who he had abandoned. And this time he came with the authority of God. And this time he did not fail. One more concept of this idea of a true redeemer. There are a few words in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew word uh, redeem, that has been translated in English, redeem. And one Hebrew word for redeem, in particular, has the meaning of a kinsman redeemer. And it's best illustrated during the study, uh, the story of Ruth. This is a familiar story. And so, but we learn three important aspects of the kinsman redeemer. It shows that the redeemer must have the authority. It shows that the redeemer <coughs> must have the ability and it also shows that the Redeemer must be willing to do that. And so <clears throat> when Ruth and her mother-in-law were childless widows, under the Jewish law they had no right to property owned by their husband. But the law of Moses did speculate that the nearest kinsman had the responsibility to redeem these women to perpetuate the name of the dead through their inheritance. A wealthy Jewish landowner named Boaz was related to Naomi, but he was not the closest of kin. of kin. He had neither the authority nor the responsibility to, to redeem these women. We know at the climax of this story, Naomi's closest relative, who had the authority to redeem, was unwilling to do it because they didn't have the ability due to a certain situation in his inheritance. So Boaz gained, hey, he did have the capacity he was more than willing, so when the nearest kinsman refused to redeem Naomi, Boaz stooped in. He had the authority and the ability to redeem uh, Ruth, and he was willing, <coughs> and he, of course, was willing to do that. This is an important concept that we understand through all the scriptures. In the, all, in the Old Testament, it continues to talk about God is, is having this in a, being our, a true redeemer. What he says is God has a right to rescue in Isaiah, the 45th chapter, that we understand that, that when Isaiah talks, he talks about God as the great creator. He also has the ability, as Job is standing before God, and he, is in, he is humbly says that uh, I know that, that you can do anything and that no purpose of yours cannot be withheld from you. He has the right and ability, and in Genesis, the 6th chapter, in verses 5 and 6, he is willing to do this. He says, and I have heard the groaning of children of Israel, whom the, Israel when, who the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, I say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out of the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from the bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched hand. This word redeem is the same Hebrew word that's been used that had been used in the story of Ruth as the kinsman redeemer. Last night, <clears throat> Brother Ben Hall used this verse, the last two verses of the book of, of Exodus chapter 2, and he talked about how God's faithfulness uh, to his covenant was never ending. What I'd like to do is look at these two verses in the context of redemption and the purpose and the, uh, and the, purpose and the necessity of being redeemed. Here it says in verse 23 of Exodus 2, Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out. And their cry came up to God because of the bondage. From the wording of this first part of the verse, it seems that the children of Israel were hanging on by a thread, hoping that this new king, this new Pharaoh, would somehow reduce the, the, the pressure that they had reduced the bondage. But it wasn't so. 
The hope, <coughs> uh, I'm sorry. Let me back up. The hope was possible to be founded on the change of attitude of the new ruler and that he would ease the pain of bondage, even restore the good fortune who was once that they had decades ago. Whomever this Pharaoh was, it was not to be. The Hebrew nation, buried deep in the, in the Egyptian culture, they continued in brutal slavery, and they had lost all sense. In the awakening desire for freedom, the Israelites poured out their remorseful and repentant hearts towards heaven, towards God, towards whom they had become calloused and complacent. God hears their, pri their cries. And with this divine covenant deeply in mind, he turns to the children of Israel as if to say, that was what I was waiting for. <laughs> for hundreds of years, that's why I brought you to Egypt, so that I can hear this genuine cries. These cries were an integral part of God's redemptive plan. Slavery affected the effects of their lives, and Israel could not save themselves. Now the entire Hebrew people understood the need for redemption, and they cried out loud for a redeemer. The spiritual application this morning is very obvious, but, but let's look through it for just a second here. Man cannot save himself. In Isaiah, the 59th uh, chapter, and actually chapters 58 and 59, it's talking about this wall of sin, the transgression between God and his people. And Isaiah writes, he said, and he saw that there was no man and wondered if there it and wondered that there was no intercessor. Down in verse 20, it uses the same Hebrew word of the, he of the kinsman redeemer, and it says the redeemer will come out, come to Zion to those who turn, turn from transgression to Jacob. Here he's not saying that there was no man in, in, uh, in Judah at that time. We had Isaiah and also at the time in which he's prophesying, there was Jeremiah. What he was explaining here is that there was no man suitable or there was no man that was able, actually able to do this. Man cannot save himself during the time of the patriarchs. He couldn't save his, himself during the time of Moses. And we cannot save ourselves today. So the same Hebrew word, it's used in, 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 in um, oh, I'm sorry. So it's no accident. It's no accident that this word kinsman redeemer is used to describe the events of the book of Ruth as it is with God. After Boaz had gained the right of redemption, he redeemed both Ruth and Naomi by his ability and willingness. We too have been redeemed. We too have a redeemer who meets the concept of redemption in Jesus Christ. He's been given all authority in heaven and earth. In Colossians, the first chapter, we understand that in all, in, through him all things consist. Jesus had both the right and the ability to redeem. And what the Apostle Paul says in, the, in Philippians, the second chapter, he did not think it was robbery to come down. He was willing he was willing to redeem. In the Gospel of John, the first chapter, John describes Jesus as God. He says he came down to dwell upon the sinful world to save mankind. God came to earth in the form of his son, both as deity and as man. He served as the nearest kinsman in the flesh and the ability to save as God. Can you imagine what it might have been like when the children of Israel were leaving Egypt? It must have been a solemn scene. There's this constant noise of over two million people that were ordering themselves, intertwined with the sounds of transport and thousands of livestock being prodded along. You hear these distant commands of people saying that we need to excavate the bones of Joseph so that you be part of our assets. And God himself will be plainly seen soon in the, 
in the form of a cloud and a fire. He was directing them to a special route. He was taking them to the promised land that each one of these Israelites had heard as they sat on their parents' knees. They were not released into an open field. They were not just completely released <coughs> to go wherever they want. They were going to this special place. The unimaginable, unimaginable day to the Israelites is a reality. God had rescued them. One writer said that they didn't leave as fugitives. They left as conquerors. It was an indescribable joy. But also, can you imagine when they left Babylon, the children of Israel, children of Judah, when they left, <coughs> when they left Babylon? Seven dec decades had separated them from the, uh, separated these people from the temple and the familiar sounds and the smells of their past worship. What a joyous occasion it was when God's people were soon redeemed and returned from Babylonian captivity. They were heading home. They were heading home to build their temple. They were heading home to build Jerusalem. They were heading home to build their homeland. It, too, was indescribable joy. One last verse that we'll look at. Isaiah describes this period of time in Isaiah, the 44th chapter. And Isaiah is prophesying events that weren't going to take place for at least 100 years. But he tells Jacob, he tells Israel when they go, O oh, Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant, I have formed you, and you are my, <coughs> you are my servant. O oh, Israel, you will not be forgotten. I, will blot, I have blottened out like a thick cloud your transgressions, and like a cloud your sins you return to me, for I have redeemed you. Here's this idea that God is saying, I have got to do this at a point in time that I will bring you back. And what he says here is he says that the Lord has done it. My mind has not been completely clear this morning. I apologize. <laughs> I've been jumping all over. But here's the point of this whole lecture. This joy of redemption, the children of Israel could not imagine, could not imagine that there would be some redeemer that was able to come and to take them from this situation that they were at. And what God did is he took them to a land so they would learn this idea of redemption. Because if you understand that, and the more that you understand it, and the more that you understand the, the distance between your sin and God's purity, the wider that gap, the louder the call, and the more that you understand it and you appreciate it. God took them down to Egypt to teach them these points. In Egypt, he let them grow up strong with a pride that they had well protected and a nation that allowed them to flourish without any kind of complications. And then he turned the situation to where they would learn to cry for a redeemer. To the point to where they said, I cannot do this myself. They couldn't believe it. They had a redeemer. I can't imagine when we think about our redemption, I can't imagine the process <laughs> that would, would, would take place. How can God take someone that's so sinful and make him to where he's acceptable to be in the, in the, in the sight of God? The more that I read the Psalms, the more that I read the words of David and Job and Isaiah about the, the, the description of Israel, I mean, the description of his creation to hit the relationship with him. The, the more that I appreciate that we all have a knowledge of God. So when I look at a lizard, 
when I look at a tree, when I look at a, a, a black-bellied whistling duck, when I look at a, a, a huge mountain, and I recognize that with God's voice, all of them recognize. So just as Israel could not imagine how God was going to save them and pull them out of Egypt, just as the, northern, uh, the southern kingdom when they are in Babylon just as they could not imagine a situation to where they would be able to be returned. The angelical world, <laughs> the heavens could not imagine the situation to where we can be redeemed. For the Lord has done it. Shout, you lower parts of the earth, Break forth into singing, you mountains, O forest, and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. We do not think and meditate upon our redemption enough. We need to recognize <coughs> that the imaginable plan is a reality. It is the things in which angels desire to look into. It is indescribable joy unparalleled. Thank you.